Hello there, greetings. My name is Wes Wennerstrom. I am the program manager for this uh, Community Behavioral Health Supports Service, uh, also known as 1915I, you may hear that. Um, our goal today is to get you a little bit more acquainted with the program and give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to fill out your core provider agreement uh, so that you can get um, set up as a billing provider. So I'm just gonna give you some quick background. So just give you some quick history. So many of our individuals residing in adult family homes and adult living facilities um, are currently um, getting supported through exceptional rates um, authorized by DSHS ALTSA. So what we're doing is shifting our payment uh, to MCOs and the healthcare authority from DSHS ALTSA. And the goal here is to help uh, support people so they can stay in our communities in these living facilities and avoid things like, um, like long-term hospitalization. Um, our goal is also, also to help providers uh, to reduce the burden of carrying some of these more behavioral clients. All right. Okay, so to do this, you're going to enroll through provider one. Um, some of you may not have your um, logins current um, and there should be support available either through provider one uh, or you can email our, our inbox for 1959i. Uh, it's hca 1959i services at hca.wa.gov. You know, give me one sec. I just want to confirm that email address is correct. Yes, HCA 1959 services at hca.wa.gov. All right. So HCA is the uh, entity that helps with billing for the state. We're here to support you. Um, let's see. Yes, and these are the topics that we are about to cover. So that's a really, really quick intro. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me or whoever's watching our inbox and we can get back to you on that. So with that said, we're gonna turn it over to Camille Lepreim. She works in our provider enrollment department and she's going to give you some step-by-step -step instructions on how to enroll as a provider for this program. Thank you very much. Thank you. And as Wes said, my name is Camille Lepreim. I work for a provider enrollment within HCA and I assist with enrolling providers into the Provider One portal. So today we are going to be going through, and let me share my screen with you. We're gonna start off and kind of go alongside the CBHS application provider guide that is available on their website. If you are accessing the website um, fresh, you can go to hca.wa.gov. And on our website, you can choose Billers, Providers, and Partners. Go to Program Information for Providers. Hey, Camille, can we um, bring up that on the screen for them to see? Bring up what part? Uh, the website. Yes, that's where we're heading. Okay, thank you. So the from the website, hca.wa.gov, we're going to click Select Billers, Providers, and Partners, Program Information for Providers, and then you'll see the programs are listed alphabetically. The one we're searching for is going to be Community Behavioral Support Services. So this is the website. We'll have all the information that you're looking for, including this CBH provider guide that we are going to be kind of walking through together. If you scroll down here, you will see it should be attached right here. 
So this is what we're going to be going over. And without further ado, I'll continue. So the Medicaid enrollment application for participating providers can now be completed and submitted online. If you have active contracts with DSHS, it is likely you will already have a Provider 1 account. If you do already have a Provider 1 account, you will see the next slides to access Provider 1 to gather necessary enrollment information. If you don't have an account, see the next topic in the slideshow titled Initiate New Enrollment. Camille, are you meaning to share something here? I don't see anything on the screen. I'm so sorry. So we might need to just uh, rewind to the website. Okay. Okay. So from our website, hca.wa.gov, we select billers, providers, and partners. And then we're gonna choose program information for providers. The programs are listed down here in alphabetical order, the one we're going to choose is Community Behavioral Support Services. And this is the Community Behavioral Health Support Services site. Scroll down a little bit, and these are the instructions right here, the view step-by-step -step instructions to complete Provider 1 application that we're going to be going over. Moving on, so here we have the Provider 1 account. Like I said, if you do have active contracts with DSHS, it is likely you will already have a Provider 1 account. If you already have a Provider 1 account, see next slides to access Provider 1 to gather necessary enrollment information. If you don't have an account, see the next topic in the slideshow titled Initiate New Enrollment. Provider 1 ID numbers are seven-digit numbers, often followed by a two-digit number. For example, we have this number here followed by the two-digit number. Sometimes Provider 1 ID numbers are also referred to as domain numbers or Medicaid IDs. If you have a Provider 1 account, you're going to want to start by accessing Provider 1. From the Provider 1 welcome screen, select a profile to use during the session. Preferred profiles to use for this are EXT Provider File Maintenance or EXT Provider Social Services. Once you have logged, in, logged into Provider 1 from the home screen, you're going to select Manage Provider Information. Next, you're going to click on step one for basic information. If you receive an error message preventing you from following any of the following steps, or if you have encounter any issues while completing an application on online, please contact Provider Enrollment for assistance. Our number is 1-800-562-3022, extension 16137. And our phones are gonna be open on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. 
closed noon to one for lunch. So while you're, you're in step one for basic information, there are two things that you will need to memorize from the screen to successfully complete your new enrollment application. The first thing is the provider name, organization name, or the provider's first and last name. You will also need to pay attention to what tax ID you are used to enroll as, if you're using an EIN or a social security number. If you are enrolled under your social security number, you're going to want to check to ensure that your first and last name are correct. If they are not correct, you're going to contact your contract specialist with DSHS before initiating a new online application. Here you can see their email address is adshqcontracts at dshs.wa.gov. If you are enrolled under your EIN, check to ensure that your provider name, organization name is correct. If it is not correct, you're gonna follow the same process and contact your contract specialist with DSHS to get this updated before initiating an online application. If you are enrolling under an EIN, you'll want to pay close attention to the provider name or organization name that you have listed. When you're initiating a new enrollment, you will need to use the exact name, so the exact same provider name. It will need to be spelled the exact same way or else a system error will prevent you from being assigned an application ID. In this example, you'll see that the provider name or organization name listed, we have it just listed as example name. And over here, it's going to be enrolled under an EIN that's listed. Now that you have confirmed the name and the tax ID listed on your enrollment, you have the information needed to start your online application. Click cancel to leave the basic information screen. And then you can click close to leave the view or update provider data screen. So this will take you back to the main page for those of you who did already access provider one. So if you did access provider one and you're at the main menu, we'll start your application by selecting the initiate new enrollment option. For those of you who did not access provider one or did not have an existing provider one ID, you can start your application online by following this link. Okay, the enrollment type. So once you click on the initiate new enrollment option, it's going to prompt you to select your enrollment type. And I'm gonna move this over to the other screen so you can see what it will look like in provider one. So if you have an existing provider one ID, like we had mentioned before, you will need to enroll using the exact same tax ID. So either whether you enrolled with your social security number or your EIN, again, you're going to have to enroll using that same number. So if you wish to enroll using an EIN, you will need to choose the enrollment type titled FAOI, or here you can see it's short for facility, agency, organization, or institute. We like to refer to this as FAOI. So if you hear me, that's what I'm referring to. So EIN, you're going to be selecting this enrollment type. However, if you wish to enroll under your first and last name and using your social security number, you would be selecting the individual enrollment type. You will not want to select any other of these enrollment types. The only two that you should be considering would be the individual if you're enrolled with an SSN or the FAOI enrollment type if you're enrolling under an EIN. So once you've made your selection, you're going to go ahead and click Submit. In this demonstration, I'm going to be using the FAOI enrollment type.
So now you'll see the basic information screen. It will become available for you to complete. We're gonna start by selecting HCA and we're gonna move over to the selected agency side by selecting HCA and clicking these little carrots to move it over to the right hand side. When you do this, it'll pop up this optional drop down option where you'll choose the billing type or the HCA billing type. For the HCA billing type, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that billing is selected. And I did wanna point out that depending on what you selected at the beginning, whether it was in an individual enrollment type or in FAOI enrollment type, this will look slightly different. For instance, the if you were enrolling under a social security number, it would prompt you to put in the provider's first, middle, last name, instead of, as you can see here, it's asking for the organization name and the EIN. Okay, so the first field that you were gonna complete is gonna be the provider name, organization name field. And I do find that it's always very helpful to have a current copy of your W-9 form handy while filling this information out because they will need to match. So here we have the W-9 form and we had already previously, we'll pretend that we had already looked in provider one and we had gathered the necessary legal name and the tax ID that we're gonna be using on this enrollment. So all should match. We have this example we're gonna be using and we're gonna be keying it into this application. So we want to make sure this matches exactly what we were enrolled in provider one with previously, if applicable. If you do not have a provider one ID and we did not get that information, this field is going to match line one of your W-9 form. So in this example, we just use the name test name As for the organization business name, this is also referred to as the doing as, as business name or a DBA is more common. And this typically matches line two of your W-9 form. And then of course we have the EIN. When you key this number in, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you key it in without any spaces or dashes. And again, this EIN or SSN, whatever one you're entering should match what you were enrolled as previously in provider one. Okay, I'm gonna pull this over here just for those of you who are enrolling under your individual social security number. So again, you'll have a completely different, it won't be completely different, but it'll have different fields. So you can see in this example, and I'll zoom in for you. It, I'll ask for the provider's first name, middle name, or last name, and the social security number and date of birth. The servicing type that would be selected is going to be regular provider, but this is only for those of you ha who have selected to enroll using your social security number and not your EIN. Okay. Okay, regardless of what <clears throat> enrollment type you have selected, the following fields are going to be required. The first one is this one right here. It says all medical providers are federally mandated to have an NPI. Is this provider required to have an NPI? And the options are going to be either no or yes.
So for 1915i providers, you will not be required to have an NPI. So it is possible that you will be selecting no if in chance you did have an NPI that you wanted to enroll, you could select yes, whichever is going to be applicable for you. In this example, we're going to say no, we don't have an NPI. And as soon as we do that, it will generate an atypical NPI number for you. You may find it useful to take note of this atypical NPI number for your records. The next required field is going to be the W9 entity type. The selection that you make in this field should match the selection that you have marked in line three of your W9 form. So again, we have our W9 form. On here, this example, I had selected limited liability company and I had marked C for corporation. So from this dropdown, since we want it to match what's made in the selection, I'm going to go here and I'm going to choose LLC filing as corporation. So they match. For other organizational information, these are the options that you have. For this example, I mean, you can choose whatever is applicable, but we're going to be going for for profit. And then here we have the contact email address. This is the email address we will contact regarding the application and the enrollment. So for example, if there's different corrected documents that will be needed, or if provider enrollment decides that additional information is needed, any issues with the application, et cetera, we will be reaching out to this contact email. So be sure to list someone who would be a good contact for this. As for the enrollment effective date, this field is considered optional, but if you would like to request a specific effective date, you will enter it into this field. All the other fields on the screen are going to be optional, such as the UBI or the W9 entity type, if other. Once you have it filled out, we're going to go ahead and click Next. Okay, now you should be generated an application ID number. It's 14 digits long. Here you can see up here in the top left corner of the screen. I do advise you to save this number for your records. And then we're going to go ahead and click next. Okay, when trying to click next, if you do receive an error message and an application was not successfully created for you, that is when you will need to contact provider enrollment for additional assistance. And again, our number is 1-800-562-3022, extension 16137. So now I'm going to go ahead and minimize this. We should be at a screen and it has a page that shows a series of steps. The numbers of these steps you'll see in the application, they can vary depending on what enrollment type you chose. We chose FAOI, so those typically have 17 steps. However, if you did choose an individual enrollment type, there would probably be about 20 steps. So there is a column status required that says if it is required or not, that's right here, or if it's optional. And then each step will also have the status of whether it's complete or incomplete. So for you should see that step one for provider basic information, it is a required step and it is complete. That is the screen that we just did. We're gonna be going through these required steps and completing all the ones that say they are required.
Okay, so the next step we're going to go into that's required is step two for locations or add locations. To go into it, you're going to click on the blue hyperlink for that step. Okay, this takes us to the locations list to add a new location because you can see there are none listed. We're going to be clicking the add button. And this will pop up the in the add physical location and other details that we're going to be going through. I did want to add as a disclaimer that my provider one will look a little bit different than yours. So I'm going to go ahead and share what yours will look like first. <clears throat> so the first section is going to be to add a physical location. The location type you're going to select is the NPI based location. The business name at this location is also going to be requested. It's going to ask for a contact first and last name. And the contact that you add here will be considered an authorized individual. This is the contact we will use if there are any issues with the enrollment or application or if required documents are needed. It will ask you to add address phone number and email. All the other fields should be optional. And this is what it will look like for you. So again, location type should be NPI, servicing location. I'm sorry, it should be base location, NPI base location. Contact first and last name, the business name at the location, phone number, email address, and then here you'll see, this is where we're gonna add the physical address. However, to add this address, you're gonna to have to go a different way and you're gonna to have to click on the add address button here that's located right after the zip code. And this is just another view of what that looks like. When you click on that, an add address detail screen will come up where you're going to fill out the address line one and address line two if applicable. And then you can skip down to the zip code, go ahead and put in the zip code, and then click validate address, and it will autofill these other areas for you automatically. So once you have validated it, you can go ahead and press OK. And then you're going to repeat the same steps to add an address for the mailing address and the pay to address. So for you, you're going to have to click on that add address button that's located after the zip code. But like I had mentioned, my screen looks a little bit different than yours. I am going to go ahead and show you how I, it looks for me, but just keep in mind that the add address is going to be different for you. Okay, so for example, this is what mine is going to look like for now. I have NPI base location, and we're going to put in the business name at this location. So for me, I can enter them directly into line one, but you, like we had shown, yours is a little bit different. I'm gonna skip down to the zip code and put that in, and then click validate address. And it did autofill like the city, the county, Washington state, all of that. I'm going to go ahead and put in a phone number. A cell number is optional. Fax number is optional. You will have to put in the email address. And then you can also choose what communication preference you would like. The options are going to be email, provider one notice, or standard mail. 
But once the, these required fields are completed, that's all you really need. Like I said, the other ones are optional. So when you go down, it's going to do the same thing for the mailing address where it wants you to list a mailing address. If your mailing address is the same as your physical location address, there should be an option for you to select that will kind of autofill this field. So for this example, I'm going to pretend that they are the same and I'm going to just choose the same as location address and click validate. And I'm going to repeat the steps for the pay to address. However, if you do have a different pay to address, you will need to add it separately, just like you did with the physical address. OK. So this last portion down here that goes over facility details, pharmacy details, regional support network details, this portion is really not relevant for your enrollment type. However, it is going to be a required field if you did select a FAY enrollment type. So we are going to go ahead and fill them out accordingly. So the distinct part unit, you can leave this selected as none. And again, these directions are on slide 31 of the instructions, the provider guide. Accreditation, we're going to leave that as no. The number of licensed beds, we're going to put zero. None. And then the fiscal year end date, we're going to enter 1231 to 999. Okay, there's no required fields down here. So that is all the required fields. We're gonna press okay at the bottom. Okay, so this will take us back to the locations list screen. You should now see the physical location that we have just added. And if you wanted to go back in here, you can go and click on the blue hyperlink number to view the information or re-edit in any information that you may have already completed. If you do make any changes, be sure to click save at the top. And then when we click close, it'll take us back to the previous screen, which is the locations list. So from here, we have at least our one physical location, which is really all that we need to ensure we have as a requirement for the application. So I'm gonna click close to go back to the main screen that lists all of the steps. Okay. The next required step is gonna be step three for ad specializations. And it does show that it's incomplete, so we're going to click on this one next. So click on step three, add specializations. And we're going to click add to add a specialization. Now, there are going to be three taxonomy options for you enrolling with as a 1915i provider or if you're enrolling as an in lieu of service provider. Here on the provider guide, it does list the three different options. So we have one adults care home, assisted living facility, and assisted living mental illness. These are the three options or the three taxonomies that you can choose to add to your enrollment. If you are unsure of which taxonomy is the right option for you, contact HCA 1915i services at hca.wa.gov for additional information. You may add one or all of the above mentioned taxonomies. Okay, so for the location you're gonna choose, there should be only at least one. If you only added one location, it will be the one that's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001. The administration should be HCA. And then the provider type goes off of the taxonomies that we just showed. So we're going to pretend that we want to add this one. So it starts with a 3 1. So the provider type, you're going to look for 3 1. 
The next two numbers are 0, 4. So in specialty, we're going to look under 0, 4. It will bring up two available taxonomy codes down here. And it looks like they are this one and this one. In this example, we're going to pretend and add this one. And we're going to choose the little carrots to bring it over to the associated taxonomy code side. Once you have moved it over, or if you wanted to move two over, you could add two. Once you have at least one selected on this side, go ahead and press OK. And this will add the taxonomy to your specialty or subspecialty list. So you have one listed. If you wanted to add more, you could repeat the same steps that we just went through. So as an example, I'll click Add. Location is the provider enrollment test location that we added. The administration is HCA. And we're going to pretend to add this one. So let's start with 3-1 for the provider type. And then the specialty is going to be the next two, which is 1-Z. You'll see that there is an available taxonomy code. We're going to choose it and use the carrots to move it over to this side. You can leave the end date blank. And we're going to go ahead and press OK. So now on our provider one screen, you'll see there are two taxonomies now listed. To go back, once you have added all the taxonomies that you wish, we're going to click Close. And it'll take us back to the Steps screen with all of the required steps. And the next required step is going to be Ownership and Managing Controlling Interest Details. OK, so for these enrollments, you will need to add at least one individual disclosure. And there are three different kinds of disclosure options that you can choose from. There's an owner, you can add a managing employee, or you can add a board or director. So the, those are the three different disclosure options to choose from. You will need to add at least one that is an individual. So whoever you do decide to list in this step, they will be considered an authorized individual on the account, and they will be able to complete and sign any of the required documents for the enrollment. You can also add any applicable organizational disclosures. So to get started, we're going to go ahead and add one, and we're going to click the Add button. OK, so the first category is disclosure category. You will need to add one individual, which is the disclosure type. So we're going to go ahead and add our individual just to get it over with. And the disclosure, we're going to pretend that this is an owner. And it will ask for that individual social security number. If you had selected for the disclosure type to be an organization, you would be putting in the EIN number in this field instead of the social security number. But like I said, there is a requirement of there being at least one individual disclosure. So I'm gonna leave it as individual and I'm gonna put in their pretend social security number. Okay, it will ask for the first name and the last name of the individual disclosure. If you did choose individual, you will need their date of birth. And then it will ask for, I oh, didn't like that date of birth. There we go. It will ask for the disclosure start date.
and you can leave the disclosure end date blank. The next required field is going to be to add an address and just like you had previously, you will likely need to click the add address button that's located after the zip code, but because my screen looks a little bit different than yours, I can enter mine directly in here. Go to the zip code, type in the zip code, click validate address, and it will autofill some of these other fields. So if you are adding an owner, it's going to ask you to enter in an ownership percentage. And this number could be anywhere between zero and 100. So I'll pretend this is our sole owner. I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna type 100. Scroll to the bottom and the other fields are optional. And then we're gonna press okay. So now you'll see our individual owner has been listed here. If you wanted to add a, any other owners, managing employees or board of directors, you will follow the same steps by clicking add and you can add the different disclosures as needed. Um, if you had chosen organization and you put in their EIN number, it would want you to list the doing business as name, the organization name. Obviously the first and last name and the date of birth wouldn't be applicable for those. So you could just skip down to the disclosure start date, the address and so on and so forth. If it was an ownership, you would have to put in the, the number here, but you can add as many as you want or you need. We have at least one individual owner and one individual disclosure type. So I'm gonna go ahead and click close and say that we're done with this step. So now we're gonna go back to this step screen. <clears throat> the next step that we're gonna go over is going to be step five for ad licenses and certifications. And although this does show as an optional step, there is information that will be needed in the application that we can list in this step. So we are going to go in here and add our business license number. So to add the business license number, we're going to go ahead and click add. You're going to choose the applicable location. There's only one that we added, so that's gonna be the only one that we have to choose from. For business license, we're gonna click on the license certification type. We're gonna scroll down until we see business license. In the license or certification number field, this is where you would be entering in your UBI number. Um, for this example, I'm gonna just go press and a just pretend that we entered in a number. It will ask for the state of the licensure. And then the effective date should be the date that you were first issued your business license. And then the end date you're going to enter is 12-31-2999. And it is listed on our instructions if you are following along. This is gonna be the end date. We use that as an infinity end date so that it doesn't expire. And then to add it, we'll press okay. Now you'll see our business license is added. That is really the only license or certification that you need to add. However, there's other ones that you want, you can add those as well. We're gonna click close and it takes us back to the required steps screen. Let's see, the next required step is going to be step nine for add a federal tax details. So we're gonna click into step nine. And to open this, 
we're going to click on this blue hyperlink that says W9 form. We're not going to click on this box because that won't do anything for us. But if you click on the blue hyperlink, that should pop have a pop-up right here that pulls up the federal tax details screen. And the information that we enter in here must match the information that you have listed on your signed W-9 form. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up again. This is our example of the W-9 form. The business name that we're going to put here should match line two. And then the address that we're going to be listing should match the address that you have selected and written down on your W-9 form. And that's in, let's see, it's in number five and six. So we're going to use this address and make sure that it matches the address on the screen. And then you'll have to also put in a phone number. And press OK. This should update the W-9 form. It won't show it like it does on some of the other steps, but if you did click into it again, it should have saved our information. You can see the address is here. And the address I entered does match the address listed on my W-9 form that we were using as an example. So once we're done with that, we're going to go ahead and click close. And it takes us back to our required steps. OK. The next required step is to add payment and remittance details. And that is for us, the step right here. Again, your steps might be different, titled different numbers if you did choose to enroll as an individual, but the, the names of the required steps are the same. So the next one for all of us is gonna be the add payment and remittance details. We're gonna go ahead and click in there. And just like all the other steps, we're going to click the Add button to add our payment. OK. It should autofill this information here, in here. But the required one you do have to choose from is going to be a location. We only added one location, so that's the one we're going to select. And then it has two different payment methods. We have electronic funds or direct deposit. And we also have paper check. So if you did want to receive a direct deposit, you will want to choose electronic funds transfer. And when you select that, you'll see the section below is going to be required for you to complete. And that's going to be your financial institution information. You will have to include your bank's name or your financial institution name, the routing number, and then it's going to have you enter your account number twice just to make sure that they match. You can choose from the account type. You can choose from checking or savings. So you'll choose whatever is applicable. The EFT account type is also going to be required. So you can choose from corporate or personal. And then you can also select the payment notification preference. So if you did want direct deposit, you will need to complete these fields. If you, don't, if you don't want to receive direct deposit and you would prefer a paper check, or you could just choose it right here and it would choose, it would switch it over to paper check. And once you selected paper check, that bottom information that you saw for direct deposit will go away. If you do do that, it also might reset this. So we will have to choose our location again. I'm going to go ahead and pretend that we're doing paper check. The next section is the electronic remittance advice information. 
This whole section is going to be optional. So if you do want to fill it out, you can. However, it is not required. So the next required thing is really to go down here at the bottom to the authorized signature field. And this is where you're going to just type in your name. And then press OK. Once you've done that, you can see your payment details will be listed here. If you wanted to change them, you could always go back in and click into that number. It'll pop open for you and you can make any changes as needed and press OK. But once you have it as you want, go ahead and click Close. And it will take us back to the Required Steps screen. The next required step to complete is the enrollment checklist, which is here towards the bottom. It's going to ask, it's going to have a bunch of questions for you to answer. The first one is a little bit confusing because it does say, has the provider or any current employee ever had any of the following? To answer yes or no to this question, that would really depend on whether you answered yes to any of these questions below. We're going to go ahead and pretend that all of these are no. And because they're all no, we're going to also choose no to the first one. And then we're going to press save at the top. Once it's saved, you can click close. And now you see this step has completed status. And the last step is going to be the final enrollment instruction step. So this step is where you'll be uploading all of the required documents. To see the full list of all the required documents, you can find them in the provider guide. I believe they're down at slide 56. So these are the required documents. We have the core provider agreement with a link on how you can download the document, the debarment statement, and your W-9 form. But this is where we will be uploading all of those forms. If you get to this part and you, you're not ready, quite ready to upload your documents, maybe you haven't got them ready yet, or you're just not ready to submit it yet, you can leave this application and you can get back into it. There is a link also on slide 55 that you can use to track your application. And this will take you back to where you can enter in your application ID just to get back into the application and complete it at a later time. So we're going to go ahead and pretend that we're going to upload those three required documents. Again, they were the core provider agreement, the debarment, and the W-9 form. Each required document must be uploaded with all the pages included. So for example, See if it's open up my core provider agreement. Here we go. The core provider agreement, it has four pages. The first page is the instructions on how to complete the form. And then slide or the second page is the core provider agreement. And the only one that really has anywhere for you to complete and sign is going to be on the last page for the core provider agreement where you will need to complete these required fields. When you're completing any of these documents, it's really vital that you read through the instructions on the first part, because if any of these documents are submitted to us and they're not filled out correctly, it will hold up the application and provider enrollment team will have to reach out to you to get corrections. So we always recommend that you read this really, really well at the beginning to make sure that all of the documents are filled out as needed before you upload them and before you submit your application.
a lot of the required documents, like you can see here for the core provider agreement, will have a field for you to put your NPI. However, some of you might not have an NPI or you might have been given an atypical NPI. If you don't have one or if you have an atypical NPI, there's no need to put that on this document. That's only going to be required if you did enroll at the beginning with your own individual or organizational MPI number. This first field here for enrolling provider legal entity name, this should match the legal name that you enrolled with on the first step of the application, or it should match what's on line one of your W-9 form. So the W-9 form here, you can see we have test name as our legal name. And so that's what we're going to be filling all of our documents out with. Test name is what I used here. We will have to have a signature and then a date. The date must be current. We don't want any past or old dates. So whenever you fill this out, make sure it is a current date. You will have to complete the name of the individual completing this form. And the title is really optional field. But that's an example for the core provider agreement. I already have this example for the W-9 that we've been using throughout the application. And again, this is signed with a current date and a current signature, and all of the required fields are completed. The debarment form is also four pages and it also has the first page is just the instructions. If you scroll down to the last page, this is where you would be filling it out. The enrolling provider legal entity name should match line one of your W-9 form. It will ask for an address, an NPI if applicable, the name of the person completing the form and a signature and a date. So these are the three required ones we're going to add to our fake application that we've been working on. So here we are, we're in the last step. We're going to go ahead and click the Upload Attachments button. Here, we'll click Next on the Add Attachment button. And it'll ask us what attachment type. For this example, I'm going to just go ahead and choose we're going to upload the core provider agreement first. The agency should be HCA. Comma is really optional, but to find it, we're going to go ahead to the file name and choose file from your computer. I'll choose the CPA example and click open. And then I'm going to press OK. It'll update and you'll see that our CPA file is right here. And then we're gonna go ahead and add all the other attachments. So I'm gonna click add attachment again. And it'll ask us for the attachment type. We're gonna choose for this one, debarment. Choose file, debarment, open. And then we'll press okay. So once you have the ones that you need listed here, you can go ahead and click close. Or you can click the little X button for this pop-up, but I like to click close. It will give you a little notification here that it just to let you know that you haven't submitted the application yet. So we're gonna go ahead and click okay. It takes us back to the screen. So you won't see the, the attachments here But if you clicked on the Upload Attachments button, like in this case, we forgot to add the W-9 form. If we click back on there, we can still add the W-9 form. You can see that we have the CPA and the debarment are listed here. We're gonna go ahead and add the W-9 form. So for the attachment type, we'll choose, and it should be here at the bottom, oops, W-9. From the file name, we're gonna do Choose File. And again, we're gonna find our W-9 form, which is down here. And press okay. 
So now you can see all of our required documents are here. I'm going to go ahead and click close because they're there. And that little pop-up again is just warning us that we have not clicked the submit enrollment button. So here we are. Let's pull this back up. Okay. So once you have submitted this application, and you would do that once all the attachments are uploaded, the last item really is to click the Submit Enrollment option. But you want to ensure that all attachments are uploaded and all the information that is needed was completed in the previous steps. If we click Close, it will take us back to the screen where it has all of the steps. And you can make any changes or updates as you need. But once you're completed, you will click the Submit Enrollment option. Can take a minute for this next screen to generate. There we go. So here you'll see the application was submitted for review. This lets you know that the application is submitted. Once the application has been submitted, you will be unable to make any updates into the application. So this is sent to the provider enrollment team where we will have it assigned to a staff member. The staff member will go in there, run verifications, and look at all the attached documents to make sure that everything we needed is there. And if anything is needed still that we, st we didn't see in the application or maybe some of the forms were not completed correctly, we will be reaching out to the email address on file to get those corrections made or to ask you to go ahead and make any corrections in the application. It is also common that if there was something that was needed after you had submitted, we would do something on our end and it would ask you to go back into the application to make corrections, but you will get notifications or emails from staff members if that is needed. So once it's submitted, it will come to provider enrollment for review. And if everything looks good in the application, provider enrollment can approve the application and you will be assigned a provider one ID number. And if you did have a provider one ID number already with DSHS, the application and all the information that you entered should merge onto that existing provider one ID number. If you did not have a provider one ID number already with DSHS, it will provide you a new provider one ID. After the application has been reviewed by provider enrollment and it has been approved, HCA will notify you that it has been processed and approved. These notices typically get mailed out. And really that's the end of the online application. So if you have any questions, we encourage you to send those to the HCA 1915I services at hca.wa.gov. Again, here's a link to the CBHS website where these instructions came from. And then if you did get stuck somewhere in your application, that's when you're gonna wanna contact provider enrollment I believe all those instructions were towards the beginning of the slides. Here we go. You can call the phone number for provider enrollment. It's the 1-800-562-3022 extension 16137. And that concludes the online application guide. I hope you found it useful. And good luck. Thank you, Camille. And I do want to stress, um, you know, if you are having trouble, the most direct way to get this resolved is to give the provider enrollment department a call. Um, we are happy to uh, forward you to the right person, or if it's something that's within our purview, uh, just as the program manager. 
um, we will try to help you. Uh, but the fastest way to get this done is going to be to just, you know, give them a call and spend a little bit of time on the phone and get that all set up. So I think that's it. Uh, say goodbye to you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for sticking out the presentation and we look forward to working with you. Take care.